Hitman Turtle. The fact that Ricky Hatton has not yet been inducted into the International Boxing Hall of Fame is one of the most egregious omissions by the IBHOF in recent history. The hitman became eligible for induction in 2017 per the organization's rules, but now in the winter of 2021, the beloved former champion is still waiting to receive the plaque and canastota that he earned in full in inside the ring. Don't get me wrong, I'm fully aware that the Hitman will eventually get inducted. He was way too popular to end up perpetually swept under the rug. So this won't wind up being a situation like an Ernesto Marcel or a Gilberto Roman, one of those guys who have been passed over for decades with no hope in sight. My claim is that Hatton's induction is already well overdue. Again, don't get me wrong, he wasn't perfect. You can't avoid the fact that he lost the two biggest fights of his career, and that has to hurt his legacy. And he also conspicuously avoided a difficult fight with his longtime domestic antagonist, Junior Witter. That also adds an asterisk in my opinion. And most of all, his wild lifestyle outside the ring left him prematurely burnt out and heading for the exit at age 31. Still, none of that can take away from what he did accomplish. He has a stoppage win over one Hall of Famer, and he has wins over a total of eight world champions, past, present, or future. On top of that, he was a global celebrity and a true folk hero in England. Every time he fought in America, he had the marquee power to turn Las Vegas into a British pep rally during fight week. That has to count for something, right? After all, it is called the International Boxing Hall of Fame, not the International Hall of Pugilistic Perfection. With that in mind, let's count down the essential eight wins of what will certainly one day be a, a Hall of Fame career. By the time Hatton met cool Vince Phillips in this internationally televised fight, he was already a superstar in England. He'd repeatedly drawn tens of thousands of fans to the MEN Arena in Manchester for fights with the likes of Joe Hutchinson, Freddie Pendleton, and Emin McGee. But Vince Phillips was much taller timber than the opponents Hatton had been beating in the defense of his spurious WBU junior welterweight title. Phillips was a former world champion, and he'd won that championship by beating the seemingly indestructible Kostya Zhu. That win over Zhu hadn't just been the upset of the year. It was arguably the second largest upset of the 1990s. Although a lot of the luster around Phillips had faded when he'd lost this championship and also lost several ensuing fights, he was still a major threat to a prospect as green as Hatton. Although Phillips had lost the athleticism and precision of his prime, once the fight started he proved he still had his championship grit. He opened a cut over Hatton's right eye in the first round and targeted that cut through the remainder of the fight. Phillips later managed to sting Hatton with a series of punches in the fourth round. But those were the only bright spots along the way. Round after round, Hatton corralled Phillips into the ropes where he let loose with wicked body punches. Those body punches, as well as his stifling work rate, allowed him to fully vault into contender status with a lopsided victory. The win truly stamped Hatton as a legit contender. Tacky had previously fought a losing battle for the junior welterweight title, and he'd earned that title fight with wins over Teddy Reed, Freddie Pendleton, and Golden Johnson. He'd also won the Ring Magazine Award for KO of the Year when he had violently knocked out former champ Robert Garcia. 
Tacky was a hard-hitting contender with a wealth of experience and a chin that surely rates alongside the likes of George Shavalo, David Tua, and Jerry Penalosa. But against Hatton, he looked like an ungainly bull in pursuit of a pale, stumpy matador. Hatton ultimately cruised to the final bell, winning by virtual shutout scores across the three judges' scorecards. After his convincing wins over Vince Phillips and Ben Tacky, Hatton's career went into a weird holding pattern for most of 2004. He scored three more wins, but those three wins were all against opponents who represented a step back down the totem pole. Hatton's frustration with his manager, Frank Warren, boiled over into a public soap opera as Hatton mused to the British media that he simply couldn't stay motivated for bouts with the likes of Michael Stewart and Carlos Vilches. Hatton's discontented rumblings paid off. He was eventually booked to meet Ray Oliveira to close out his 2004 campaign. Oliveira had been a solid contender for an entire generation. The relentless pace Oliveira set in the ring was legendary. The New England native held multiple CompuBox records as well as a convincing victory over then WBA champion Vivian Harris. Once the bell rang for the opening round, it became clear that whatever advantage Oliveira had in stamina and volume punching was dwarfed by Hatton's vastly superior skill, power, and body punching. Before the fight, Hatton and his trainer, Billy Graham, openly said the fight with Oliveira was, in their view, a dress rehearsal for an eventual title shot. That level of focus was immediately on display. Hatton came out bobbing and weaving like a miniature Joe Frazier, mixing up his offense between chopping overhand rights and wicked left hooks to the body. He dropped Oliveira in the first round, but displayed a veteran's poise, never rushing to get a quick stoppage. Instead, he stuck to the game plan, harassing Oliveira mercilessly along the ropes. Hatton capped off that relentless attack by dropping Oliveira again in the 10th round. Exhausted and bleeding, Oliveira knelt on the canvas for the 10 count, allowing himself to be counted out by referee Mickey Van. It was the first stoppage loss of his career. Intriguing, mysterious, sensational. Kostyad Tsu, the Australian-based Russian whose blend of skill, ring craft and power have made him one of the finest light welterweights of all time. There is so much that could be said about the illustrious career of Kostya Zhu. His decisive win over the late, great Vernon Forrest to win an amateur world championship deserves a mention. So does the fact that he beat Juan Laporte, Roger Mayweather, and Livingston Bramble as a relative novice in the sport. Don't forget that he had two dominant title reigns as champion. In the first reign, he enjoyed an 80% knockout ratio in his title defenses. Then, he rebuilt himself after losing to Vince Phillips, emerging as a killing machine with robotic precision. He knocked out the likes of Zab Judah, Miguel Angel Gonzalez, and Rafael Ruelas. Just prior to this fight with Hatton, Zhu had returned from a torn Achilles to pummel top contender Sharmbe Mitchell in only three rounds. That remarkably easy win over Mitchell had been so impressive that some boxing fans suddenly began predicting that Zhu would reign as champion for at least another five years. In the build-up for this fight, Hatton was given very little chance to win. And looking back, you can't be too hard on the people like me who predicted that Zhu would carve up Hatton like a miniature Henry Cooper. What we'd seen from Hatton up until that point was impressive, but the evidence suggested that he would probably walk straight into Zhu's power punches and get knocked out. Instead, Hatton started the fight absolutely on fire. He closed the distance faster than Zhu could handle, and on the inside he roughed the champion up in the clinch. The frantic pace Hatton set clearly frustrated Zhu, who always preferred to fight at a slower, more calculated tempo. Every few rounds, Zhu did manage to rally, but each time Hatton would again reassert his command. As the fight entered the championship rounds, Hatton was clearly leading on the scorecards, but instead of coasting to a decision win, he elected to accelerate. Fight. There will be no 12th round. 
getting next time to fight fellow titleist Carlos Mauza. Mauza was fresh off his own stunning upset. That victory came against the formidable knockout artist Vivian Harris. Harris was a highly regarded protege of the late, great Emmanuel Stewart. Harris had defended his WBA championship three times in a row and was, at that point, being mentioned as a potential opponent for Hatton, Floyd Mayweather, or Arturo Gaddy. Any one of those fights would have made Harris a small fortune. But instead of waiting for those opportunities, Harris instead opted to fight Mauza for $75,000 and got knocked out in the seventh round for his trouble. Congratulations, you played yourself. Against Mauza, it was Hatton's job to make sure that lightning didn't strike twice. Although Hatton was more experienced, more proven, and a more polished fighter overall, Mauza was not the bumbling goofball that his critics made him out to be. In the fight itself, Hatton was cut early on by headbutts. But, as against Vince Phillips, Hatton was totally unaffected by the taste of his own blood. Following the instructions of his coach, Billy Graham, he dictated the tempo, controlled the range, and wore Mauza down with a steady barrage of punches before ending the fight with a leaping left hook, one minute into the ninth round. That Floyd Patterson-esque left hook was, without question, the single finest punch Hatton ever landed in his pro career. Two fights after beating Mauza, Hatton faced another Colombian titleist, this time in the form of Juan Urango. Against Urango, Hatton was returning to junior welterweight after looking relatively shaky and winning the WBA welterweight title from Louis Colazzo. Hatton began 2007 with a three-step plan aimed at world domination, and the first step in that plan was a confrontation with Urango for the IBF championship. Urango was a major obstacle. He was impossibly broad-shouldered, and in addition to being huge for the weight class, he was a southpaw. He had impressive wins against Carlos Vilches, Andre Eason, and Herman Angujo. Whatever strengths Urango had, he never managed to apply them against Hatton. Hatton deviated from his usual swarming attack in order to adopt a safer strategy, bouncing on the balls of his feet, sticking and moving, and occasionally exploding with flurries to the body. But weirdly, in this fight it was Hatton who was hurt by body punches. Several times he was visibly bothered by Urango's punches to the midsection, and he tired later in the fight. Although he looked uncharacteristically vulnerable between the ropes, he weathered each rally by Urango and cruised to a decision win by scores of 119-109 on all three judges' scorecards. Hatton moved on to the second stage of his 2007 takeover. That came in the form of a fight with Mexican legend Jose Luis El Temible Castillo. Although this bout wasn't on pay-per-view, it was about as big a fight as HBO used to broadcast on their championship boxing series without bumping it up to pay-per-view status. The pre-fight atmosphere was made even more manic by the thousands of English fans who crossed the pond with Hatton. During fight week, they filled the air with football chants as well as some serenades they had composed just for Hatton. For his part, Castillo was viewed as an elite fighter who was thought to be probably near the end of his prime. A year earlier, he'd been forced to move up to 140 pounds when he finally lost his ongoing battle with the scales. Although the stoic veteran from Sonora didn't hold a world title going into this fight, he was absolutely a proven commodity. That proof was established with a pair of title reigns and a deep resume that included wins over Cesar Bazan, Stevie Johnston, Juan Lascano, Joel Casamayor, and Julio Diaz. But beyond all that, he was best known for two things. First, he'd given Floyd Mayweather Jr. the toughest fight of his career. That loss remains one of the most hotly debated decisions in boxing history. And second, Castillo was known for splitting a pair of epic bouts with Diego Chico Corrales. Based on all of that, this fight was expected to be a blood and guts battle fought in the center of the ring. Commentator Max Kellerman primed viewers, saying that it was safe to pencil this one in as a fight of the year contender. 
Even before either man had left their dressing room, Max was soon made to wish he'd swallowed that prediction. Although both Hatton and Castillo came ready to throw knuckles, the gulf and talent was just too wide to make for a great fight. From the opening bell, Hatton dominated the action, with the fight rapidly settling into a non-competitive beating. Barely able to land a glove on the Englishman, Castillo was visibly forlorn between the third and fourth rounds. In some ways, the ending of this fight paralleled Hatton's win against Castillo. Sensing Castillo's crumbling resolve, Hatton accelerated to start the fourth round. Now, if Harold Letterman's scorecard is in line with those of the official scorers, Castillo's got an uphill fight on his hands. In December 2007, Hatton lost his unbeaten record when he was knocked out in the 10th round of his super fight with Floyd Mayweather Jr. Although Hatton had fought competently and had even managed to lift a few rounds off of Mayweather, the knockout ended Hatton's aura of invincibility and it left him emotionally devastated. Hatton pulled himself together after a few months and went about the task of trying to put his career back on track. That effort got off to a difficult start. In May of 2008, he looked shaky in his first fight back. That fight was a unanimous decision win over Juan Lescano. Although Hatton won the fight by lopsided margins, he looked vulnerable. He was visibly shaken multiple times by Lescano, and he was fatigued in the championship rounds. Hatton felt like he needed a change. He fired his longtime trainer, Billy Graham, the man who tutored him in the sweet science from the beginning. The firing came as a shock. Hatton's choice to replace Graham was even more stunning. When you say he, you're talking about Floyd Joy Mayweather Sr., the former fighter, now poetic writer. You're talking about the greatest of all time, not this time, that time, full time, part time. But of all time. It was an unusual pairing, the self-deprecating, working-class Hatton and the outspoken, relentlessly self-promoting Mayweather. Many expected the partnership to crash and burn when Hatton met his next opponent, Pauli Malignaggi. Although Hatton enjoyed an edge and experience, Malignaggi was no stranger to big fights himself. Despite his championship experience, Malignaggi was visibly intimidated and unfocused when the fight started. Hatton happily exploited Pauly's performance anxiety. He wobbled the New York native badly in the second and buzzed him several other times throughout the middle rounds. Every time Malignaggi got the slightest rhythm going, Hatton broke it by clinching and then resuming his marauding attack. After the 10th round, trainer Buddy McGirt sounded ready to stop the fight as he pleaded for more offense, while Malignaggi half-heartedly said he wanted to continue. When Hatton continued to pour on the offense in the 11th, McGirt stuck to his promise to stop the fight, waving the white towel. Although it was Hatton's last career victory, it was one hell of a final win. It cemented his spot as one of the top 10 junior welterweights of all time and as a future Hall of Famer. I am nice, but I'm awful crucial with these hands. What's up, Pensacola in the house? What's up, Jersey, D.C., all my people all over the world, baby, Patterson, New York.